Growing up, I was a tall, lanky fellow with huge feet. I had yet to grow into my sneaker size. I was a child that had low self-esteem, and I didn't think I was smart. I was in some remedial classes. I didn't even think I was handsome. Growing up, I even had a kid that was my friend make fun of me because I had a really bad speech problem. He said that when I talked, I sounded like a dirt bike because when I stuttered, it was like, went, 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 went. It was a bad stutter. It was years later that this tall, lanky kid with a bad speech problem would find himself arrested and falsely accused of a horrific murder. My years in prison were the worst years of my life. I remember being fearful that I would grow old in prison. I remember fearing that I would lose contact with my family as the generations got older. I feared my mom dying when I was in prison. And I feared dying in prison myself. It was this time in prison that I remember seeing this image of a bird seemingly rising out of ashes. And this bird was a bird that I'd never seen before. And the ashes represented my life. It represented my life because I had to destroy myself. I had to break myself down as a human. And what I mean by that is I had to detach the things that allowed me to feel, that allowed me to connect. I had to detach those things. I would eventually part ways with my attorneys. And this was done in the face of extraordinary fear and extreme anxiety because there was a fight that was going on for my life. And I was the only one that wasn't in the fight. I didn't know how to fight. But I was friended a guy in prison that was very good with the law. And he was a good guy. And I asked him would he help me. And of course, he helped everybody. And two months into him saying that he would help me, I remember being on a wreck in a unit and standing at his door talking to him because I wanted to know the progress that he was making on my case. And like I said, it was during my wreck, so everybody was out of their cells, either making phone calls or taking showers or playing cards or dominoes. So my back was to the wall, and I was talking to him through the crack of a, the, the, the crack of a door. And so, you know, I wanted to know what was going on, so I asked him. I said, you know, what's good with my case? Did you see anything? It's like, what's, what's, let me know what your thoughts are. And the more he talked, the more frustrated I became. He wasn't saying anything that I was willing to hear, anything that I wanted to hear. And as he began to hear the frustration in my voice, he said to me, they call me Sai. He said, Sai, you gotta learn this shit. He said, what are you gonna do if I die tomorrow? And he had a bad heart, so I understood that he wasn't just being mean. But I was livid. I didn't wanna hear that. I needed help, I couldn't do it by myself. I didn't know how to do it by myself. I, I didn't even believe in myself. But at that time, I got my paperwork back from, you know, kind of my shoulders hung over and I made my way back to the cell. And in the cell, I had to sift through the anger that I felt, the hate that I felt, the hurt that I felt. And under all that was fear, I was scared because I couldn't fight. I didn't know how to fight for my life. But I knew that this wasn't the time for my low self-esteem, my lack of confidence, my not believing in myself. So I turned my cell into my own little makeshift law office. I mean, there was papers everywhere, papers on the wall, papers on the floor. And I folded back my little two-inch mattress. And there was papers on that and on a metal slab that got laid on. See, 
Years prior, I began to work on myself and deal with some self-development. And it was in that cell, it was cell 60 of unit N1, that things began to come, to come together. And I knew that I had to shift through my fears, my self-doubt, to come to a place where I can construct some legal arguments. See, when I spoke about the ashes of the phoenix, it was because I was in hell burning and I was innocent. So as I constructed the arguments, I ended up sending them out to an attorney by the name of Rosemary Scapiccio, and she wrote back. And when I see my name on a legal mail list, I got really excited, but I got fearful as well. I was a ball of emotions, but because I had to detach all of that, I told myself, hold on, wait. I had to prepare myself in the event that she told me no, she couldn't take my case. And I also had to prepare myself any, for not becoming overjoyed if she said that she would. She told me that she was interested, but I had to wait for three months for her to clear my death, to clear her death. And the question for me was, could I be patient? But this represented hope for me. When I didn't have any hope, I just knew I didn't want to die in prison for a crime I didn't commit. But as I was reading that letter, I had the biggest smile on my face. I just didn't know that patience would mean that I would spend an additional 12 to 15 years sitting in prison as we fought. It was 22 years in total that I spent in prison. But I remember on that day that I walked out of that courthouse with my mom's hand clenched in my hand, I felt like that phoenix. But this time it was the bird that was rising from the ashes. And to you, I say, still we rise. Thank you.